Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Tatiana Show. I am alone today. Josh is on a plane somewhere, but I'm ready to bring you the best of the freedom-loving world today on May 8th. Um, our first guest today is Sean Malone, who's a friend of mine uh, over at Fee. And we've been talking a lot about, in fact, I think this whole episode is going to be kind of arts and crypto. Um, not that Sean is going to be forced to listen to crypto stuff all along, but we did connect on that level. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in using um, the arts to communicate ideas. And so is Sean. So I'm excited to have him on the show. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Tatiana. It's good to be here. Awesome. So for people who don't know you, I mean, I've got this uh, big bio and stuff in front of me, but uh, in your own words, if people, you know, what's your background? How did you get involved in this crazy space? Uh, well, my background started initially having nothing really to do with this. I've been a kind of a, a libertarian my whole life, really. Um, I, I was probably 14 or 15 by the time I started thinking that even as a label that that would apply to me. Um, but I, I never set out to do this kind of work professionally. Actually, I set out to be a musician and a composer. Uh, thus, What do you play? Th th oh. Vibraphone? <laughs> <laughs> um, predominantly, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a composer. Um, that's what I, what I went to school for. And, and then also, I'll, I'll do this. And oh, right player. on. Um, but... Uh, but I went to, to college and grad school for, for composition, originally for percussion, and then it then shifted into comp, uh, and then film scoring, which um, sort of led me to making films. Um, it was something that I was always kind of interested in, and by the time I got out of, uh, uh, out of graduate school uh, in New York, I was probably just as interested in making films as I was in just scoring them. And then as I started doing that work, it actually got more and more boring to me just doing the music and rather than doing sort of the whole thing, writing, producing, editing, um, and directing and all that kind of stuff. And that led me sort of back to the Liberty space because in about 2008, uh, 2009, I was working in the music industry in LA and um, bored to tears with a lot of the conversations I was having with people in LA um, that, really, I didn't think really got it. And then I would go to um, the handful of kind of libertarian websites that existed at the time. Well, I mean, it, a lot of them still around today, Reason, uh, Mises.org, Fee even. Um, and none of them had video content really at all. And then I would, I would turn around and I would look at what content was available um, from places like Huffington Post or Think Progress or any of the, the kind of groups that were really consistently advocating for a larger state and more government involvement in people's lives. And their video content was invariably actually pretty good. Um, and then I had a moment where um, my roommate at the time, who was an editor, uh, was working for a little boutique production house doing movie trailers mostly, but they their, his boss was connected to Hillary Clinton somehow. And they did a video for the State Department that I watched, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on it. It was about water rights. Um, it, it really, what it was about didn't really matter. The point was that the production values were amazing. Um, Matt, Matt Damon narrated it. <laughs> um, and it was only four or five minutes long, but they spent tons of money on it, put tons of resources into it. And basically the message was give the government more money to do more stuff that the government does. And then I would look around and the only thing that was available for countering that narrative was basically college professors uh, lecturing people for an hour and a half with a bad handicap. And I thought, really, it was sort of like I said about 2009 and I thought, man, like somebody needs to do better. And I, I kind of came into this space um, around the same time that Reason TV started and that a couple other people who are kind of doing this thing, this kind of thing now uh, really got going. But really when I started, there was, there was just nobody else doing it at all. Um, and now, you know, seven, eight years later, I'm actually really proud to say that I've, I feel like I've built a, a pretty good career um, doing high quality work. And, and the more I get to do it fee, uh, that's, that's only getting better, which is really cool. So can you tell me what exactly you are working on at Fee? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm director of media at Fee, 
Um, and my role there is to not only produce creative media content, which is a huge part of the role, but it's also to help lead a an ongoing grant funded project, which we're calling YEARS, Youth Engagement Audience Research. And basically what we're doing is over the next few years, we're trying to very systematically actually study what mainstream audiences are actually want in terms of what kinds of content is is effective what what's resonating with people what um, what we can do better not only as an organization but also to spread that information around the overall kind of network and and the liberty movement for lack of a better term um, and what's great about it is it's the first time I think anybody in our space has ever really asked the kinds of questions that we're asking we're we're not t trying to simply ask um, how can we get our message in front of people? Rather, we are actually asking, what do viewers actually want to see? And the, the, the way that we're talking about it is completely different. And to give you an example of that, I've, I've actually recently commissioned and we're sort of in the final stages of running a, a market research uh, study that uh, for, I think for the first time in our space is actually studying not just what our own, what fee.org audiences are interested in, but what broad audiences are interested in. So the kinds of things that I have uh, coming out soon are um, hopefully going to appeal to, to mainstream audiences, not just to other libertarians and, and to people who are already kind of in the space. Right, people who are already sympathetic to the cause. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's so important, and and I personally have experienced a lot of frustration as a person. You know, I went to Berkeley College of Music. I did a lot of stuff in the music industry here in New York, and joining the Liberty Movement, there was some music, but for the most part, I'm not really sure how much value the community even saw to that kind of a thing. Whereas to me, yep. it was the most obvious, important aspect of of conveying an idea is is using art and music and creative ways of reaching out to people. I mean, that's how you get, you know, you hit them in the feels, which I hate that expression, the feels. It seems so <laughs> grammatically incorrect. I saw, but, saw your post the other day about that. <laughs> oh, it makes me mad. But <laughs> um, but at the same time, I, I do think that there's something to be said, like for the the ability of an emotion to convey an idea. And, and I feel like we've really been missing the boat. So I was very happy to hear about your work with that. Um, do you think that, do we have any kind of um, examples of things that have worked? I know that you just put out a video, you're, you're starting a series now. Um, what have other kinds of um, organizations put out up to leading up to this? Well, so we're, the way that we're doing the, the overall project is it's sort of a multi-stage kind of a thing. And I also, by the way, I'll say up front that I actually take kind of a long view on a lot of this stuff. YouTube channels take a long time to build, uh, to, to be successful. Really, any kind of creative uh, career path takes a long time to get rolling, as, as you know. I mean, you, you don't just put out um, a song on the Internet and expect the first thing to be, you know, it, like blow up like Gangnam Style or something like that. That's not how it usually works. Uh, and by the way, as I, I wrote in a, to somebody earlier today, even Gangnam Style had th the entire state of South Korea behind it. So it's not exactly that organic. Uh, Wait, when you see the those state things. paid for them to do oh, that you video? Didn't, oh, you didn't know that? Yeah. Wait, yeah. why would they pay yeah, for them to do that video? <laughs> yeah, Gang Gangnam Style got got subsidies from, from South Korea's Arts uh, Council, whatever to be made and then the the government paid for a lot of their advertising and stuff but but why would they want to advertise that like that was a it was a I, funny I, video but it was ridiculous i don't even think it is a good look for anybody uh, i was be honest, like i, I want no to go to korea now i have no <laughs> yeah. idea so um, bizarre all right sorry but, for the random tangent no 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 but so so i'll give you a couple examples so one of the things that we're doing is testing older things that already exist uh, some of the things that I've made, some of the things that some of the other organizations in our space have made, like uh, Learn Liberty is is a great partner of ours. Um, they do great, great content there. They do, and they have a ton of it, which is great for us because what we're able to do is start um, creating sort of audience segments on Facebook, social media, and stuff like that, and then putting things in front of those audiences in really targeted ways. 
So we can start learning things about whether or not uh, a Learn Liberty video about uh, free trade, for example, um, is, is something that is being responded to well by different groups of people. And honestly, what we found so far, and it's, it's fairly preliminary thus far, but what we found is, is that for the most part, people who are already libertarian um, are really big fans of that. Um, people who are not uh, really aren't getting it that, that much. Um, and they're not sharing, they're not engaging in the same ways. Um, so one counter example to that is, is that uh, one of the first things I made at Fee was a, a piece that um, is, a, is about, um, I don't actually don't want to spoil it too much because there's sort of a twist ending, but it's, a, it's about a, an inventor named Elijah. You can find this video on our, on our Facebook page. And it's about a, a, a black inventor who was the child of former slaves in the late 1800s who became a household name. And it's a really cool story. It came out of uh, our president, Larry Reed's book, Real Heroes. And when we started testing that, what we found is that that video did, um, okay, it did fine with libertarians. It did really, really well with uh, black women and people interested in black entrepreneurship, which was not terribly surprising to me because it's about a, a, a little boy who grows up to become you know, a great inventor um, and, and I think that's really instructive. It's not that we tried to message something to that audience in a way that was, um, uh, you know, sort of done by committee or we, we weren't trying for that audience per se. We just wanted to tell a good story. And that story happened to be about somebody who resonated pretty well with this, with this segment. And I think that that's sort of my overarching lesson that I think we're going to learn throughout the whole project is that talking to people from different backgrounds is really about finding ways to relate to them. And that, that shouldn't be something that feels so, um, you know, kind of centrally planned. Like it, it doesn't need to be that way. It just needs to be authentic. It needs to be a story that you want to tell or th that has something to do with our ideas. Um, but which appeals to people because it's a genuinely good story and it's because it's a story that they want to watch or they want to listen to or, you know, like in your space because it's a song that they want to hear, right? Not just because it's got the message, but because it's, it's good entertainment. Um, uh, you, we can put up a link to that video. I really don't want to spoil it because there is a twist to it, but, um, yeah, that's, I mean, those are the kinds of things that we're doing. And then going forward, you, you mentioned I, I started a, a video essay series. We just have one episode out right now, which is talking about uh, why the Empire in Star Wars is, is actually bad, which seems like a really obvious thing, but it's actually a little bit more interesting than um, just Death Stars and blowing up planets and stuff. Um, the next one that I'm writing right now is actually on the Edgar Wright movie, Hot Fuzz, which is one of my favorite comedies. I love that movie. It's so good. Didn't they make a part two? I think that they did. They, they did not, but there is, but there is, uh, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on the name of it? It's uh, At the End of the World, which is sort of in the same universe, but not really. Like, it's like Shaun of the oh, Dead. Oh, I think, yeah, Shaun I know of what the you're Dead and about. Hot Fuzz and At the End of the World all are, are you know, kind of together, but they're not really the same characters, but it's the same vibe and everything. Anyway, Hot Fuzz is, is a great movie and it talks about, um, it gives me an opportunity to talk about anyway, the idea of the greater good, which is something I think people don't think about very seriously. Okay. Uh, and that'll, that should be, that'll be out at the first Thursday of next month. But yeah, the series is called Out of Frame and uh, we're running it on uh, Fee's YouTube channel. And we're starting to put out a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff on that channel over the next uh, six months or so. You're going to see a bunch of recurring products that come out, become series, uh, different web series like that. So, um, Do you think that the ROI on that is making sense? Because, you know, I've tried to do video and I find video to be extremely expensive. No matter how I try and leverage any of my relationships. And I'm, I mean, I have a better advantage than somebody else, for example, in the middle of nowhere or whatever, I have access to certain things. Um, I like that with video, you have something that is evergreen and constant, so you don't necessarily need to get the value out of it right now. Yeah. But do you think that 
that medium is able to be supported by, you know, essentially, I don't think that there's that much money for libertarian stuff in the first place. Um, but have you, you know, have you gauged the the level of uh, of success yet at all? Or what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I hope uh, the answer is that yes, it's been wildly yeah, successful. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my yeah, answer is. No, yeah, we absolutely have. And and there are there are lots of ways in which the videos that we we've produced at fee over the last uh, six year, roughly year that I've been there have been really successful. Um, I, I think there's an interesting question here though. Um, the, the, the first couple things I did at fee were really designed for kind of more libertarian audiences. The first thing I made for fee, one of the first things I made in years anyway, was a piece that compared Bernie Sanders to Milton Friedman. And that, immediately with no advertising at all got a million uh, 1.3 million views I think in about a week and that's great and that's really exciting and when you look at ROI on something like that you, you'd be tempted to say oh this is great because it didn't cost that much we didn't spend anything on advertising and look at all these millions of people who were able to see this the problem was when we actually started looking at it, what we found was that the, the audiences that really watched it were all libertarian already. And that's not really the goal I'm going for, right? Like what we're trying to do is figure out ways to reach out to people who aren't already on board with the ideas. And that kind of changes the ROI conversation a little bit because what we have to start doing is thinking a little bit longer term and thinking about how to build um, a channel or build a, a network even, if you want to think about it in those terms, that people start recognizing and coming back to on a monthly or weekly basis where they understand that this is going to be engaging, interesting content that anybody can watch, that 95% of people who aren't already libertarians are going to actually enjoy as well. So fortunately, I'm in a, I'm in a position where I have good funding to work for the next three years on the project that I'm working on right now. Um, and we're gonna need some of that time to build some of these some of these products. So like, for example, the, the out of frame piece has all combined between YouTube and Facebook about 20, uh, I don't know, about t roughly 20,000 views, um, which is okay. Um, it's not where I want it to be, but it's the first in a sort of a longer process to build what I hope fee becomes a, a media channel, right? A channel for people to come to knowing that they're going to get this great content. And fortunately also with the, the year project that we're doing, anything that I produce is actually really useful from an educational standpoint because it's all stuff we can test and all stuff we can learn from. So that's, that's part of it for me. So that, that's kind of how I've solved some of those problems, but you're right. It is tough. It's definitely tough. Well, I I am glad to have your your head in the game because I think that it is important to leave some time for it to for it to you know bloom. I guess mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of points. Have you guys tried to um, to uh, partner with any kinds of schools, or is it only through you know YAL or SFL that you get integrated into schools in terms of bringing in the content there? Some sort of partnership opportunities, for example. Or yeah. do schools think that you guys are too libertarian? Do they not like that? No. Well, so we haven't, th this is pretty new for us as far as the, the kinds of things we produce, but yeah, we actually already, and partially through our, our academic programs for, for those who don't know much about fee fee is a 70 year old or organization that through out its entire history has offered public seminars to students. Um, usually, and, and for the last 10, 15 years, it's been mainly high school and college students. So we have a pretty active network with pro teachers, professors, um, you know, college students, high school students, stuff like that. Parents, actually, we do a lot of homeschool work as well. So we are incorporating some of this video into, into those programs, which is really helpful. Um, but a lot of what we're making right now um, is sort of in the testing phase. So we haven't made like a whole series of products that we can roll out to uh, any one particular uh, school or w with a course or something like that. But that's absolutely in the plan. That's that's part of how we're going to make, uh, keep getting more and more value out of, out of video. Um, 
So what I liked about the example that you used um, versus the two examples, you had the trade video, which in my mind, even though I'm a libertarian, I was thinking to myself, that sounds so boring. Uh, but then the little story about the little uh, the little boy, I thought, okay, well, here's something where, you know, it was popular block entrepreneurs. Well, it's almost like you're giving them something that they care about. The average person, I don't think, cares about trade. Why? It has nothing to do with their everyday life in a way that they understand. But, um, you know, when they look at the little black boy, they're like, oh, that's like my little nephew or that's like my cousin's kid or whatever it is, you know, it kind of resonates with them. And I think that might be an important component of, of, of really having, you know, some sort of results. Um, it makes sense. Do you, I, I was talking to a friend the other day and we're working on a project together and he was so excited about my enthusiasm for the project because, um, you know, he thought that that would be what, what we were working on, make it different was that enthusiasm. But I noticed I had a hesitancy in explaining to him some of my drive because it is libertarian. And even though I feel like I have a lot in common with people on both the left and the right, yeah. the music industry is leftist, but really it's very difficult to speak with them yeah. about these ideas without them automatically shutting down and freaking out. I mean, yeah. it's mass hysteria if you if you break the party line for a second, and it's really frustrating. How have you um, personally dealt with that? You know, you've you've had a lot of experience in Hollywood. I mean, it's like the leftist capital of the world, and you know how 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 have you found um, connecting with people on a personal and professional level? Do you think it's limiting with your views, and and how have you dealt with that? I, I mean, it was tough. It was tough, and I mean, I've I've been kind of outside or a little bit a part of that world for a while now and it was really uh, it was really a valuable decision that I had to make for myself because part of part of my problem was that um, the, for example I used to work in in live music uh, I w was a manager of uh, about a hundred different musicians who were working in, in entertainment environments uh, actually on cruise ships which is kind of entertaining it's working for Barry Manilow's company at the time but um, we, the, the boss of that company would send out emails on, I don't know if it's a weekly basis, but like several times a month where they would basically be, you know, not just Republicans are evil, but that was always a big theme, but it was like anybody who isn't uh, on board for Hillary, this is like 2008 when Hillary was, was running versus Barack Obama in that, that first run. And he was, Pro Hillary all the way, you know. Even Barack Obama wasn't good enough. We couldn't have this. I mean, until Obama got the nomination, and then obviously it immediately flipped to Obama. <laughs> but, but you know, we would get masks company wide emails all the time that would you know have this political message. I always thought that was funny because you know once I joined the the sort of professional liberty activism world. You know, I, I worked for the, the Koch Institute for four and a half years. I never had one person tell me how to vote or what to do. Like n nobody uh, outside of the entertainment industry has ever told me, um, has ever sent an email from a position of authority in the way that I would get when I was in that, that world. And I think that it's so weird because I, it's, it's not what they preach a lot of the times. You know, you preach tolerance, you preach openness to different ideas. Um, and I, I, I found it very difficult a lot of the times. And it, and it forced me to keep my mouth shut and simply avoid certain conversations or avoid conversation topics. Um, you know, it's, it's not a pleasant environment to be in if you don't agree with with everybody now that said i've also have a number of really great friends in that space who are currently working in the entertainment industry still working in the entertainment industry today who actually agree a lot more with libertarian stuff than um than they're willing to talk about and you know you do end up finding people who will talk about it privately you know and build community around that which was which was valuable and is valuable, and I, and I would hope that people do that. Honestly, though, my solution was to kind of sidestep it, to get out of it, to not be somebody who was going to be stuck in in an environment where I was never going to feel like I could express myself in the ways that I thought was important. 
Um, and that's really what, what caused the shift in my whole career out of that world and into a world where I could talk about the ideas that I think are, that, that I think really matter, you know? And honestly, it's, it's the best thing I ever did. I mean, getting to a point where you can um, create art with a purpose is incredibly meaningful. So, yeah, I certainly agree with that. Um, I'm very excited to see what else is going to happen um, with with your department. Um, very exciting. What is the? Are you planning anything for FeeCon? I'm I'm coming out there. I'm very excited. So June for listeners, it's June fifteenth to June seventeenth. If they want to come down to Atlanta, party with me and Sean. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, what's your plans for that? Well, FeeCon's besides my performance. Yeah, your performance is going to be great. Um, but we're the FeeCon is really exciting to me. This this is very different from what Fee has ever done before, and I think it's very different from what anybody else in our space is doing. We're we're we've always been a, a, an organization that tries to put on seminars that have really practical value to people. So it's the idea of this the whole event is not to have. A bunch of people sit in a room and and talk about sort of, you know, libertarian or classical liberal philosophy, and all just rally each other around caring about politics or anything like that. This is a this is a conference with ten different tracks, uh, and and each track is geared towards sort of practical advice about how to improve your own life and to help you transform the world in some way. And one of the tracks that I've been the most involved in and very excited that we even have is a creativity and arts track, which nobody, I, I, I don't think anybody's really had at one of these kinds of events before, at least not on this, this level. So um, I've, I've been able to put together a panel of, of YouTubers, some, some of whom you know, uh, like Julie Borowski and uh, Remy Munosafi Go Remy. Um, and uh, we, the internet, is going to be there on that. But I've also put together a panel of a really diverse and interesting panel of creative people who are pretty high level in their careers, uh, representing um, a Hollywood screenwriter. Uh, we'll have a comic book artist who's a great friend of mine, who's an awesome artist, um, a, a really high profile YouTuber um, who uh, um, has a very successful channel. Um, we're going to be talking about how, how, not only how you get into the arts, how you have a career in the arts, um, but practical stuff about what it's like to actually do this kind of thing for a living. Um, we're really excited to have you down there. You can talk about this kind of stuff with people too. And then I'm also actually going to do some technical, I, I don't know what, when exactly on the schedule this is, but I booked out some time where I will just be available to answer technical Q&A about filmmaking, music, audio, anything that, that anybody wants to know more about. Um, I'll, I'll actually be available too to just answer questions. So it's, it's actually really exciting and going to be crazy busy at the same time. So. Well, I love the Atlanta crew. Um, I remember they're definitely in the top five liberty communities that I know in America. I like really really love them so i'm excited to nice. go i'm excited to be a part of it and uh thank you for making the intros uh on my behalf um to make it oh, happen yeah, um, yeah atlanta is awesome by the way i've i've lived here for about a year now it's it's probably my fa favorite place i've ever lived and i've i've lived in new york and la and dc portland like at atlanta is a really cool town so i hope everybody who comes out here has a really good time yes and they have to call it hotlanta <laughs> Uh, in, ju in June, you definitely will. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I gotta, I have to get prepared. I forgot that it's going to be that warm, but I'm going to yeah. try and put together a party while I'm there and, and, uh, we'll, we'll connect later this week and we can yeah. talk a little bit about how, uh, yeah. how I will spend my time visiting Hotlanta. Uh, <laughs> I have to say it with that accent too. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully our interstate's fixed by then too. That'll, that'll be helpful. It's, oh, well, I don't understand the implications of oh, your you, interstate. You, oh, hopefully you didn't. I won't have no. You, didn't, you didn't see this. Uh, one of the it, it's right by my house. This is why I really care. Uh, a, a section of I eighty five um, caught fire and and collapsed. Oh. Like no biggie. A, a month oh, ago. I saw that. It yeah, looked crazy. Not that many people died though. I understand. Nobody, it nobody was... died. Nobody died. Yeah. Fortunately, oh. I, I assume that what happened was the fire got out of control and everybody was like, nope, not not going anywhere over there. 
Um, but yeah, it's right by my house. So it, it's a problem for me. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, I will, <laughs> I'll make some calls. I'll be like, listen guys, I'm coming to town. Me and Sean are hanging. Let's get this cleaned up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks very much, Sean. One more time, if people want to connect with you, where can they watch your videos? Uh, give me some links and ways for people to connect and then uh, we're going to bring on Sean. Yeah, if you want to connect with me personally, um, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at, at Citizen A Media, um, or Tatiana can give out my email. I'm not that precious about that kind of stuff. And uh, if you want to see what I'm doing right now, come to to Fee, uh, either Fee.org or go check out Fee at Fee Online at pretty much any social media platform, specifically YouTube and Facebook are probably the best ways to, to look at the videos that we're doing right now. So, but yeah, facebook.com slash fee online or youtube.com slash fee online. Rock and roll. All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot. And I uh, look forward to hanging next month. Thank you. It's great to see you. Take care. Peace out. Bye. Cheers. Okay, everybody. So we're about to bring up our next guest. I'm very excited to see John again, but before we do, I'm going to tell you a few different random things. Hey, John. Um, number one, this beautiful, uh, what do you call it, hoodie that I'm wearing. You too can purchase this for Tatiana coin or dollars or any other kind of cryptocurrency at my website, TatianaRose.com. I have my new album, Keep the Face. I really encourage people to check that out. I think it's my best record yet. And uh, you can preview it for free on SoundCloud and you can listen to it on Spotify. But I don't think that streaming platforms are that great for artists in the long run. I don't know. It's sort of an interesting question of what's what's happening to the music industry and, and me and John will talk about it. But before we talk to him, have to hold your freaking horses. Um, <laughs> you gotta go to the bitcoincpa.com. Uh, learn a little bit about taxes and Bitcoin because uh, you can get into trouble if you don't do your taxes properly. And Kirk is so wonderful and helpful. And he has this cool service where you pay I don't know, a small amount of money monthly and they basically do all your tax and your uh, bookkeeping for you. And it's pretty affordable. So I recommend that people check it out. It really will save you a lot of time and money um, for sure. Uh, crypto Compare is a sponsor and we love them. They're so nice. Um, you can get all your latest crypto news at CryptoCompare.com. Um, big supporter of the Ross Ulbricht family, and we all want to help Free Ross. So go to FreeRoss.org to find out more. And if you can't donate, although you should, and you could also spread the word, tweet their stuff. You can just buy stuff on Amazon using the clicked link on their freeross.org website. And then every time you purchase using that link, a portion of the proceeds will go to help free Ross and also to help Lynn spread the message about ending the drug war and the travesty that is our justice system now. Um, Hi to my homies at Third Key Solutions, SovereignTech.com, awesome podcast, Sex and Science Hour. I'm getting through the third season right now, cracking up. There's some solid gold about communications. And hello to my buddies at NetKey and Volturo. Uh, okay, that's it. That's all the that's all the advertisements that we have for today. And John, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Hey, Tatiana, great to be here. This is like a role reversal. I've been on your show, and now you're on mine. I love it. I love it. So uh, the weather is beautiful here in Nashville, and my dog Max is right here by my side, only because I had treats and I lured him in here anyway. Can you show me his face? I would like to see it. Let's see. Here. I like Hang dogs on. very much. I, I like pets in general. I've got a lot to move here. See. If oh, I can... you can't just lift him up. Uh, lift him up? <laughs> no. No? Max. Okay. Well, whatever. I guess we can't look at your no, dog after Max, all. come here, buddy. Come here. Yeah, Max, jump up. Come on. Show some liveliness Max, here, here, bud. Buddy. Come here. He doesn't seem very lively to me. Come here. He's come like, here. no. He's, Max, he's very here. camera shy. Oh, there look at you just bribing him and oh. his white little oh. nose or his white little face. <laughs> very cute. Um, well, he's, he's not that active. He's... Uh, I guess he's like almost 80 years old in dog years. He's 11 and a half, so he's pretty old. <laughs> well, he's been a good friend so far, I'm sure. He um, does. I have many things to tell you and to talk to you about, but the most important one is that I'm coming to Nashville next week. Yes. And so is Adam. Can you believe it? Well, now I knew that Adam and um, Crystal, Crystal were, but I yeah. didn't know you were. Yeah, I'm coming That's down awesome. for that same music conference. So I hope oh, that we all man. get to you know, have a beer together or something while I'm there. Um, yes, let's have dinner. If we, if you guys have time, I'd love to have dinner with you guys. 
Yeah, that would be great. Um, we're we're tentatively picking out our schedules now, so we'll we'll link up uh, offline. I don't think the whole entire world needs to know my plans for Saturday night, but <laughs> I agree. Hey, and before you guys go book like go booking places and like going to restaurants and stuff, just please ask me because I really do know the ones that people say are good but they're not good, and the ones that are good and special little dives that have amazing food. So please definitely ask me. I love it. You know, I love the hot chicken too. I gotta tell oh. you. Um, I didn't know about that until the last time I was in Nashville and I was impressed. Hot chicken for the win. Um, yeah. So have you lived in Nashville all your life? No, no. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana originally. And um, I was there until I was 25. And then I moved to the Bay Area uh, after my brother moved there. And I lived in Atherton, uh, San Mateo and San Francisco then for 10 and a half years. And I worked in Berkeley, had a great job in Berkeley for years. And um, then I've been in Nashville now for 17 years, 17 and a half years. It's hard to believe. Well, you don't look that old, but that's a whole lot of places over a long amount of time. You're looking good. What's the secret to your success? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I drink my own urine. No, I'm only joking. I'm oh, sorry. well, I would hope not. Um, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm sorry. Um, so why did you end up in Nashville? It's it's a blooming city. There's all sorts of um, activity. You know, they've got the BTC Media crew over there who yeah. I adore them. They're so nice and just, I mean... You know what? There's a lot of shady people in the industry, but the BTC Media Company is straight up awesome, family owned, A plus plus plus. Actually, yep, they yep. own Let's Talk Bitcoin where we um, broadcast. So That's now right. it sounds like I'm shilling, but I'm not. I actually just really <laughs> love David and Callie and everybody over there, Tyler and, and the crew. Uh, Christy's always really cool to work with over at Bitcoin Magazine. So, yes. hello. <laughs> um, hey guys. Yeah, I love those guys. Those guys are great. You know, it's funny because. Uh, back in just go back five years right and we were struggling to get a, a bitcoin meetup going here in nashville we had one that it fell apart and these guys tried to get a board of directors and all this goofy stuff and it pretty much fell apart we were left with just like this kind of lame once every couple weeks once a month maybe bit lunch right we get together at this crappy mexican restaurant and then btc media moved to town right david bailey and his crew and in Cummins station which is right next to downtown and that was just like, for me, the greatest thing is like, okay, now Nashville really can become a Bitcoin city, right? So since then, you know, those guys had uh, what they have, Hashed Health, which was at the Skirmerhorn, which was, I think, the world's first uh, distributed health conference. Um, yeah, I think it was the world's first, and that was exciting. There's another one here this year in September at the Skirmerhorn again. Skirmerhorn's our symphony center. It's a weird name. It looks like Shermerhorn, but it's Skirmerhorn. Anyway, um, so then uh, we had another group that was started by John Bass here in town. He's in, been in healthcare for years, very successful businessman and a really nice guy. I actually know his family, but uh, he started Hashed Health. And so that is really, has really brought to Nashville that extra layer. So we have a little Bitcoin meetup. We're struggling to get off the ground. BTC Media is helping us with that. And then Hashed Health is now offering a blockchain meetup that we have. Uh, I think they have a meet meeting once a month. And that has kind of exploded with professionals and people that are interested in blockchain. But, you know, it's funny because when you go to those meetings, it's kind of taboo. You can't use the word Bitcoin. I mean, you can. Oh, I hate that. You know it's what I mean? I know. Phony baloney. Phony baloney. It's like, come on. Bitcoin what you... forever. B-I-T-C. Oh, I am. I, <laughs> I know. I tried I to do a cheer. I was not a very good cheer. I was, Sorry. Ready, I was getting ready to join you, but I know I feel the exact same way. It's like, okay, look, Bitcoin's the thing that started this whole insanity, which is really so beautiful in so many ways, despite the little bickering and stuff like that. that that's going to happen in every single industry that's competitive. You're going to have bickering. You're going to have stupid stuff, and it'll all, it'll all work itself out. So I don't, I don't, None of that bothers me, but you know, Bitcoin's the thing that started this. So now it's like, you know, we can't use Bitcoin because it has these negative, you know, connotations and associations with drug markets and all this stuff. So we'll just we'll just use the word blockchain, and then we can get all the professionals. But you know, then when, when the professionals find out you mean Bitcoin has something to do with this, then they're all freaked out. 
because they were fooled. I thought you told me it was blockchain. It is blockchain, but it's Bitcoin. Why are they blockchain. so averse to it? Do you think yes. they just think it's like a rebel currency? I want more rebel yeah. currencies. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do too. But I mean, I think that yeah, if whether you're liberal or conservative, if it's if it leans toward libertarian, then it's like, oh, this is like, come on, man, we're all in the same friggin' country. Whether you're far left or far right or in the middle or libertarian or whatever or a crypto fascist or a crypto anarchist, whatever. <laughs> crypto fascist that's a horrible thought but um yeah, i was a little confused <laughs> so like, that doesn't sound like a good time. <laughs> no but you know whatever you are come on let's just face the facts that if you have kids your kids are going to be living in the same friggin' country in the same borders probably and your kids kids and your grandkids and they're going to have to get along with those guys grandkids and that person's grandkids so I mean, we've got to figure out a way to stop this divisive bullshit that's pulling us apart and it's being engineered we're being it is now being we're being duped basically and uh, what's the best word what's the best way to put it um dividing people is now expertly engineered in my opinion so the best thing that anybody could do regardless of what political side of the fence you're on is just do everything you can to not be divided to to work with your friends or with your neighbors who disagree with you politically work with them and get in, get on the same page man it's just one country we got to make this shit work yeah well i've got a song off the new record same side but i will say that sometimes nice. it can be a little difficult i don't know if you were listening to me and sean's interview but oh, yeah. yeah i think it's a uh, it can be a little bit tough to bridge the gap between people um have you what's what's the political climate like down in nashville i mean i know that do you do a lot of music while you're down there and, and how's the the political spectrum musically because in new york you know if you have anything other than a certain position you know you're thrown to the wolves even though in other ways you might be very similar um not that we should be totally dissuaded by ostrac being ostracized but still uh it, it is something but i would think that maybe in nashville because it's kind of you know the south ish it would be a little bit different um what do you think is the is the vibe down there in that regard well i mean first of all you know tennessee is definitely very conservative that's the political climate here but then you have nashville which is you know this semi-liberal bastion of people you know in the center of tennessee really right and then you have east nashville which is this you know very liberal i would say um very open-minded very progressive in terms of lifestyle um compared to the rest of nashville which is you know very different from the rest of tennessee so you know that you have that kind of political uh climate and then music wise you know traditionally obviously going back grand old opry and all of that and uh, little jimmy dickens and on up to merle haggard and johnny cash and all that you know it's it's country music and there's new country which really i don't like much of at all but um there is you know now a pretty good uh independent music movement here i would say you know with little indie labels it's not hard to have a, a studio in your house obviously right and um but yeah i think that uh, i think that the music here has definitely opened up to people who maybe have a stronger background or interest in jazz and in classical you know nashville does have a pretty good um does have a pretty rich i would say diversity of people that are in music you know you do have classical musicians that are here um you do have classically trained musicians that come here to become studio musicians um, although it, it most people that are in nashville that are in the music business um they're in the music business you know we have belmont which is a music business school and that music business to me is so often uh counter to what I love about music itself and performance itself, right? And we all know that. I mean, honestly, so I moved here 17 and a half years ago, moved here in 2000, roughly. And I have yeah, started playing the open mics and I played all of the open mic places in town for about two years. And then I just got burned out because you go to an open mic and you've got to sit there. If you're not the first one, if you're not in the first 30, 45 minutes or hour to go, you've got to sit there for an hour or two hours and wait while you hear these cookie cutter songs, everybody hoping that they're writing the next new country hit. And it just wears you out. And then you get up there and you play your song, one or two songs and a night and it really kind of wears you down because you hear a lot of cookie cutter music. So I still think 
even though Nashville has a good indie music movement, new music, and there is um, also a good black community here, and they have definitely different music than the music business here. Um, I would say black musicians have a, their own community here, which is a, a rich and vibrant community. There's also a, a Latino community here, Hispanic community had, that has their own rich and vibrant music business, you know, music going on. But it's it's nothing compared to a bigger city like Chicago or New York. There's just this is still so small town, sm so small potatoes. The music industry and the politics here are still in many ways run by a good old boy network. Um, of fools, if I don't, if you know anybody <laughs> doesn't mind me saying that, but you know, so I, I honestly, for myself personally, I don't really know where I fit in. I only know that the music business itself is what has pushed me away. And so after those two years of doing open mics here, I just really kind of drifted into my own thing and got into podcasting and kept doing my own work, which is research and, um, started a boot wax company and I still write music and play music, but I very, very, very rarely play out. Um, and my, my goal though, I have to tell you my goal and this is like jumping way ahead and, and uh, I definitely want you to ask questions, but my goal is to make enough money with cryptocurrency to start a band. And the thing is here, if you want to start a band, like that's your own band, you've got to pay people. You've got to pay them for rehearsals and you've got to pay them for shows. That may sound, you know, like it's not that unusual, but what I mean by that is if you want to have your own band, it's a difficult thing here because, okay, so you go out and you're going to hear a band go into a popular venue and you hear this band play and you go hear that band play two weeks from now, local band, and there are only two of the guys that you saw the week before because the other three guys, the bass player, the drummer, and the guitarist, they've all three got three completely different gigs they're playing, so the band brought in three other players. So it's a town of mix and match your players. So when the audience hears the band play, usually, like, God, they're great. The tourists are like, man, these guys are amazing. They're blowing me away. Yes, but if you understand what it means to be a band that is um, has this cohesiveness because the guys have played together, the guys and gals have played together for years, that's a very different sound and a very different feeling than this band that each week has hired guns coming in to play the different parts. Yes, they can read the charts, and yes, they can pick it up very quickly because they're studios, you know, quality musicians, but you're missing out that feeling of this is the band. Like, where's the little, where are the young little Rolling Stones dudes or the Cure dudes, you know, or the stray cats running around town. We're the band. It's not that way. So it's it's in that in that regard. If you want your own band, you know you'd have to lay down the rules. One, you can't play with anybody else, <laughs> right? And two, when you show up for rehearsals, you get paid. You show up for shows, you get paid, and you know move forward that way. So that's my plan. That's my master plan. Wish me luck. I do. I know how. I know the feeling. People always ask me why I don't play with the band. It's like because I don't have an extra thousand dollars lying around every freaking time I want to do a show. Would exactly. make forty dollars. Like, exactly. You know what? Television has really ruined the impression of what a musician is. A lot of times, people will say, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a get a real job vibe to people's um, totally. reactions to telling them that you're a musician. Totally. But God, being a musician sucks. <laughs> no respect. Maybe if you're a guy, at least you get some chicks, right? I don't think it works the same way. Like men don't really get all hot and bothered by women musicians. So I don't even get the perks. And it's expensive and it's time consuming. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, musicians are some of the most hardworking people that I know, because usually you have to get a day job. And then when you get home, the real work begins yeah. um, on your career, which is in, in a lot of ways the, the, the main identifier for people, right? Um, yeah. But you also, you've been doing this podcast. You also have a, a Bitcoin song of your own. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we could splice it in, but I don't know how to do that. That would have <laughs> actually been a good thing to think of in advance. Oh, um, man. Oh. I know. I don't know how to do. I, I'm not technologically advanced, and, and Brian who's helping me is. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to put him on the spot. But you do have a podcast um, for people yeah. who who haven't listened to it. You know, tell me a little bit about the podcast. Okay. Yeah. So um, my former podcast co-host Lid Shaw. He owns the Toy Box Studio here in town. You've been to the Toy Box Studio when you were in town. Yeah, I love okay. it. Totally. Okay. Really good vibe. Great vibe. Great little studio. And um, so he told me about, um, well, and actually, okay, so years ago, we were going to a Bitcoin meetup, and 
he said to me, you know, we should do a podcast and you can be the host and I'll record and everything. I said, hey, it's kind of a cool idea. That very night we got home, found out about Let's Talk Bitcoin, found out they had a contest, um, entered the contest, just threw a show together, which was pretty much all Lidge throwing it together. We interviewed someone we had just met at the meetup and we won, you know, editor's choice. Adam said, I like these guys. They're goofy. We want them on here. And plus they're calling themselves Bitcoins and Gravy, which is completely ridiculous as far as a name. Right. But anyway, so, you know, then Lidge has moved his own way. He's doing podcast professionals. He's doing very well with his own podcast for engineering and all of that. And I'm still doing the show. I'm doing like one every three weeks. It's taken its toll on my hand and on my neck and all that stuff. But I still love doing the show. I still love interviewing people. I love the whole Bitcoin world and you know I don't really plan to stop I'm just trying to figure out like I feel like I want to move more toward the educational aspect of it so I am uh, interviewing a guy from Vanderbilt University a professor who's teaching classes in blockchain um, I'm interviewing him Friday morning so that's exciting to me and I just interviewed a guy who is uh, in a program here in town that can relate in the health and healthcare to blockchain and Bitcoin tech. So, you know, I think that I think there's a lot that is untapped in the Bitcoin world, but I feel like I kind of want to move more toward education uh, with Bitcoin and, uh, you know, continue to do music. And yes, I do have a Bitcoin song. It's called Ode to Satoshi. And what most people don't know, I got I got a lot of flack when I put this on YouTube at first. It's called Ode to Satoshi and then in parentheses, the official Bitcoin song. What people don't understand is it's not the official Bitcoin song at all. That's just part of the title. Okay? Registered BMI, that's part of the title. <laughs> so people are like, you shouldn't say that because there might be other ones. I'm like, that, that's, ir that's irrelevant. That's part of the title. I could call it the poopy Bitcoin song, but I decided to call it the official Bitcoin song, which I, I know think that's better. I think the poopy one would have maybe had some, <laughs> some difficulties. But, you know, I mean, what do I know? <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think you're right. So I do have a few other Bitcoin songs. I have um, I have a song called Crypto. It's a reggae song about cryptocurrency trading. And then I have uh, the Bitcoin Blues, which is basically just like my lamenting all the stupid things that I didn't do or that I did and that I should, you know, all the things I should have done but didn't do in the Bitcoin world. Um, and then I have one more, which is called the Bitcoin Trader, which is about it's uh, written from the perspective of a Bitcoin trader who is like the world's greatest Bitcoin trader. All he does is just like win, win, win. Every time he trades, he wins, and he's just a mass, you know, a mass this wealth based on his brilliance in trading. And you know, the times I've tried to trade in the past, it's like lose, lose, lose. Every whatever I did, the opposite thing happened. You know, if I sold, that would that would be immediately when the price would skyrocket, and so so depressing. It gets to the point where it just tears you up inside. That you know, for me personally, as far as trading, I had to say, I'm done. I don't trade anymore. I have my crypto folio, as I call it, my cryptocurrency portfolio, but I let it sit there, and you know, it's a bull market. Everything seems to just keep climbing up, and so I don't really have to do anything to continue to grow my wealth, which. I definitely advise people to, you know, to get involved in cryptocurrency and get a little crypto folio together and just then kick back, make sure it's stored as safely as you can and then just watch it. I know I've definitely well, I definitely went way off the question you asked me. It's okay. It just made me think of something. Yeah, people save your passwords. The other day I thought I lost one of my passwords. <laughs> And it was so mortifying because I have a show about this stuff and I couldn't, I was, it was so mortified. Luckily I stored it somewhere and I got it, but That's man, good. that gave me a swift kick. Yes. I was like, Oh, I need to, I need to work on this. Um, yes, cool. it's a so, scary feeling. Very scary feeling. For sure. So have you talked to Adam at all about the token.fm project? You know what? I have not. I mean, he is so busy and I get busy and, then we just don't, our paths just don't cross. And I'm kind of just waiting until he has some free time. And I'd love to, you know, always love to have him on the show. And, and uh, forget him. I'll tell you all about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know. Who needs that guy? Yes. Tell me about it. No, if you know no, about no, it, no, I, no, I know thought that it. you guys did it, did uh, an interview about it because, you know, we're getting oh. ready to launch and we use Tatiana coin to, to fund this uh, latest push of my new record. Um, I think that, you know, our crowdfunding campaign was a little bit early. Um, token.fm was 
estimates when doing tech stuff are not always accurate. That's what I learned. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's exciting to see the pro uh, the progress and hopefully empowering a lot of different artists um, through you know that platform and and also onboarding people through the power of music. Um, you know, the average person doesn't really see the need for Bitcoin or for a cryptocurrency. But if you had a Taylor Swift coin, I bet you the price would go right through the roof because people yeah. want to be, you know, they'll they'll jump over the hurdles if they have an artist that they really want to get closer to. Um, so I think it's I think it's sort of an exciting time. Um, I agree. I don't know. Any final uh, predictions or anything? We're coming up to the end of the show. Do you have yeah. any, well, any juicy tales of... of uh, <laughs> A crypto gossip for the crowd. Well, I do have it's juicy. Tricks. I do have juicy tales of crypto gossip, gossip, but I'm not sure that I can tell any of them. Um, I will say no. All right, fine. Adam has walked me through that, and I'm such a non-tech guy that I'm still, you know, I have. I guess I'm set up with a little uh, uh, token FM thing of myself of my own with a few of my songs on there. But honestly, like if two weeks goes by from the time we've set it up, it's been like a month now. I don't even know where to find it anymore. That's how bad I am tech wise. So I've got to. Definitely get up to speed with that. Um, and all I can say is that I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in Nashville and to hearing your album. I actually didn't even know that you had a new album out. That's how lame I am. And I'm definitely looking forward to hearing your album. And if there's like a sign, something of it I could get with your signature, that would be awesome too. Well, I'll I, be seeing you in person. Did you know that Ross Ulbrich drew my album cover? No, I, mean, I didn't know that. It, it makes it sound like he drew it for the album cover. He actually drew a picture of me for my birthday. And he took a picture that Judd Weiss, who's a famous libertarian photographer, took a okay. picture and drew it for me, you know, just because he's nice. And uh, and and I decided to use it as the album cover because I thought, what better way to illustrate the need for artist independence and for free speech with artists than to bring attention to the black sheep that benefited everybody in Bitcoin? Nobody here would yep. be here without the Silk Road because of the way that it allowed Bitcoin its first real use case. And Ross has paid the ultimate price. We're taking him back. I mean, um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of uh, good efforts on the on the legal front that are that are going on right now. We're waiting for the the result of the appeal, but there's a few things otherwise. Um, yeah, but you know, the drug war. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. You know, the drug war is a nightmare, and it's a bipartisan issue. So yeah. I think it's great to be able to bring attention with that album cover um, to a contentious topic because I think of Russell Bricht as a hero. Uh, nothing short of that. I've met him before. When I, I mean, I've gone to visit Ross a bunch of times. I'm going there tomorrow, actually. And I'm never, I mean, he's one of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life. He's not only kind and intelligent and peaceful, but he's very thoughtful and he's very idealistic and he's extremely principled. So um, I, I think it's awesome to be able to use art to bring attention to injustice. And I think that it's incumbent on, on all of us. So I applaud yeah. your work. I'm really psyched that you're making music um, to educate people and, and the content that you're making. I know how hard it can be to, to put together a podcast. Um, so yeah. if people want to stick around and, or, well, if they want to listen to you, Brian, if you could, um, I'm like talking to somebody off the screen. Uh, I'd love to include hey, some links to your music. Um, so please send them over to us, uh, especially those okay. new songs. I'd love to promote okay. them. But if people want to listen to you, where do they go? To find me, go to bitcoinsandgravy.com or just go to Let's Talk Bitcoin. And you can hear my show or you can hear Tatiana's show and all the other great shows. Yeah, uh, we Let's have a great network. network. We do have a great Absolutely. network and we have a new owner. So we're just hoping, David, if you're out there, be nice to us, buddy. And um, I know David will be because David's the best. <laughs> oh, and I, I want to give a quick shout out to my friends at the crypto show. They just had me on last week or maybe, yeah, last week. And nice, uh, they're just, show. Cool. yeah, I love all the shows on, on the network, but I wanted to give them a special shout out. Totally. Uh, it, makes me, it always makes me want to live in Austin. It like, seems so vibrant. Like those guys are having so much fun and I'm like, I'm here in Nashville by myself with my dog. It's like, <sighs> well, you won't be alone for long. I'll be there on Saturday. So let's, uh, let's link up offline and, and come up with a plan and, and get together. Sounds good. All Thank right. You, take Tatiana. care. All right. Thanks everybody for watching the show. Please pick up your uh, copy of keep the faith at tatianamorose.com. You can listen to the music there. Uh, share this show. We need your support. So, you know, feel free to leave a tip or, um, you know, share this around on social media. Facebook is charging so much 
to reach my own fans. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not that sad. Don't worry, guys. Dry your eyes. It's a good light. It's a good world out there. So uh, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks again to Sean. Thanks, John. Thanks, Brian, for helping out. And um, we'll see everybody soon. Peace out.